Hello, everybody. Um, can those of you who are online, can you hear me? Just send a quick. Uh, yes. Very okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm very happy to introduce um, Mark Antonio Awada, who actually was invited initially by our beloved Peter before the pandemic, and we're very happy he can speak with us today. Peter was very interested in Mark Antonio's research, and we're pleased that we'll be able to hear about it today. He has an amazing background. He worked in um, quantitative equity and convertible arbitrage, convertible bond trading at Morgan Stanley. He also worked on the sell side at Chase, BNP Paribas and Dresner. On the buy side, he's been a PM at Sanofia Group, Bally, Bally, yes, yes, yes. Bally um, Asset Management, and also Alp Investors. Is a PhD in theoretical physics, true, lock, true rocket scientist from Imperial College in London. And right now he's head of research and data science at the Harvard Digital Data and Design Institute, which I guess is part of the B School. Is that right? It's part of Harvard Business School. Is right, exactly right. He's also um, adjunct. Uh, I'm sorry, Philly professor of physics at Florida Atlantic University. We're very happy to hear him speak about new. I'm sorry, <laughs> new energy classification with implications for the for equity long short portfolio construction. So I guess you're going to tell us whether now is not a good time to index, but to do active management, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. James. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well. Thank you very much for everyone for inviting me here. This is for me a very special invitation, not like others before, because it is um, in the memory of Peter, who has been actually a very dear friend of mine. Peter and I, we go back to 1994, when we actually started together at Morgan Stanley. And uh, we kind of came through that big wave of hiring rocket scientists, you know? So uh, we had a kind of joint forces where you know, uh, Peter was focusing on quantitative, you know, methodologies and formalisms using his brilliant mathematics. I was more on, on the actual pragmatic aspects of the quantitative implications and looking to convertible bonds. And then, of course, you know, we, we hanged in there and we created a lot of great strategies that actually Morgan Stanley made a lot of money. So that's why they kept us in our jobs for a long time. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, you know, uh, I kind of ventured into more into quantitative trading and Peter, um, you know, kept on the, on the theoretical formalisms of, uh, of trading strategies. Now, of course, you know, we all went our way, but we kept, me, Peter and I, we stayed in touch for a long time because we both were alumni actually of Morgan Stanley. So we used to cross paths quite a bit. And I used to come back to him about some of my work that I'm doing, you know, which also sometimes it is actually a theoretical, but, application work and this work was one of them. So one month before Peter passed away, I was telling him exactly about this topic. And he got really excited. He said, Mark Antonio, I think this is going to change the way we think about market, about industry specification. We can in fact even do better portfolio construction. And I want you to come and give a talk. I said, absolutely, Peter, no problem. And, um, and then unfortunately, Peter passed away. And to be honest with you, since his passing, I actually resisted to give a talk on this subject for over a year and a half. And I wanted to, this to be the first talk that I will give on this paper in memory of Peter. And for that, I'm dedicating this speech to Peter. So thank you. And I think I can move on now. Um, so the topic is new industry classifications with implication for long short equity construction. I did this work with uh, Paul Hamilton and Professor Suraj Chizbisan at you know, the Harvard Business School. And I'm part of the DQ Institute of the Harvard Business School. Of course, this work has been over a period of three years and uh, it, we wouldn't have actually completed it if it wasn't for the input and a lot of work from Professor Shrikant Dabar, who's actually now the Dean of the Harvard Business School. But I started the work with Professor Dabar way before this, like since three years ago, and now he's the Dean. And then of course, Professor Robin Greenwood, Peter himself, we get great insights into the work when we are trying to finish it. And so therefore I owe these people a lot for their contribution to this topic. Okay, so what do we know? I mean, let me give you a quick summary before actually I indulge into the details. So what was the problem? 
if you are actually meeting with quantitative strategies, if you're an asset manager, uh, a hedge fund manager, pretty much everybody relies on what they call the global, you know, jigs, you know, for industry classification, which tells you that there are 11 sectors, you know, the usual suspicions that, you know, utilities, retail, energy, and all that. And people use the stocks in those sectors and they try actually, if you are a discretionary trader, that's your Bible and actually to construct a discretionary trading strategy. And if you're a quantitative guy, you still rely on that. So both the quants and the discretionary use the jets. Everyone uses the jets. In fact, even the market, this is 500 is based on the jets. So, okay, great. Um, what, what is the driving foundations of the jets? Let's understand. So if you look at the way it's in P500 and, 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 and Morgan Stanley MSCI, the driving force is actually based on the revenue of a company and their business model, if you will. Yeah. So they say, okay, well, I mean, I can see the revenue of, and what, what, what people are selling like Amazon is similar to Walmart. So let me pack them together. Uh, you know, so it's number driven, it's quantitative driven. And then you get the research analyst that comes out there who sits down, you know, and put his view, his or her view, and say, you know what, I think, I, I think Amazon looks like Walmart, let me pack them together. And that's had been the, the, the theme or the, the, the path of in which the Morgan Stanley MSCI did it and SMP did it. Okay. And so it's now the Bible, the JEX. But um, what are the problems with the JEX? The problems you can see it actually when you start really seeing black swan events. If everything is going Hank Yori, you know, you're not going to see much difference between Amazon and Walmart. And I keep uh, repeating those because these are like prime examples. And of course, you're gonna to see tons of examples like that. You are not seeing them in terms of, you know, I mean, in terms of a strategy. But when there is actually a crisis in the market and like, uh, like you know, a swan-like event like 2015 when, you know, the crisis coming from China or 2020, in fact, the COVID crisis, Suddenly you see that they are actually, while Amazon and Walmart are in the retail consumer staple sector, one is going up and the one is going down. So something really broke off. So why? Of course, if you are a discretionary trader or an asset manager, intuitively you see, I can look at Amazon, it looks like a technology company. Walmart is not really a technology company, it's still a retail company. So you have an intuitive feeling about what they are, but you don't know how they are described properly, and why they are like that the way they are. So let's take actually, again, an example, and that's from real life. So if you are actually someone sitting at one of those, you know, big trading houses, Millennium, Beliazni, all those guys, you have everybody's new statistical arbitrage, yeah? And so this is coming from my actual real life experience. This is not a theoretical word. And Peter Bessel said, <laughs> Told about it. Said, okay, I'm not going to prove that. But I like the proof you did in the end, but I believe what you're doing. So that's, I think, one of the key points. That if you are a one trader and you are actually doing pair trading and you've been making money on, let's say, Amazon and Walmart because they are happen to be in the same industry, you are following the religious book of the Jets. Suddenly, you start actually find that actually your trading strategy is losing money. You know, and. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to actually find out why, because you look at the correlation between them. And I studied in 2013 just to make it as well. And you see that the correlation actually between them start breaking down. They don't correlate. They don't have the same dynamics. So why the chips keep insisting putting them in the same industry, in the same sector? So you, you could tell, you could feel that there's something not right. Okay. Then the World Bank, which is another big hedge fund, out of million, $15 billion, their guys in 2020, just when we we're doing this paper, came and said, for God's sake, can someone save it out from the jigs? The jigs doesn't make sense. How could actually in a world event where companies ever constantly changing because of technology and AI, huh? People, things are changing. We are not seeing that change detected correctly among companies in part of that sector. So definitely there was a problem, a profound problem that even Partitioners and you know and practitioners in the industry could see it, they could smell it through the losses on their book, and there wasn't a trick of how to solve it. So they tried to do smart things, they group things differently, but like like almost blind leading blind. They don't know what is the actual mechanism that you need to group stocks that the JIPS doesn't do it for you correctly. 
you think, Martha, that the that the gigs and the and MSCI are pretty much the same methodology? Same methodology. It's all. This is very important, and this is, is going to be crucial. This is the world we are going to live in. So you see, at Harvard, for example, one of the biggest things we are focusing on is what we call social sciences, unstructured data, contextual data, because we genuinely see that there is information in this data. There are insights that outgone numbers, language, texts. But you know, of course, to do that, you need firepower. You need a new types of algorithms, a new types of mechanisms, which unfortunately 20 years was not available. Now it's available to the course what I would call machine learning. Okay. So where is the problem? How can we go about the problem? So Shikan, myself, who's now the dean, and Paul before actually, so we have like there's like five people who have both of this. So okay, that's back in 2019. And so I was actually still in the trading operation. Okay, um, Uh, I don't know how to put, okay, here, let's see. I'll get that. Let me just run on here. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we need James, uh, probably. Uh. Yeah, I, I don't know actually here how we can navigate out of this here. Oh, there's a mouse here. Let's see. Uh, this, uh, this thing is uh, Oh, okay. Go back to the show. Okay, very good. Okay, okay, fantastic. Okay, very good. Okay, and let me go back. Go back yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. Good. So we were thinking, okay, now, well, then how can we really know about these companies? Well, the best source for us is actually the 10K finding by the SEC. It's incredible. Because every company in the United States and similar in Europe, every year they have to file about their business model, their business description. So if you look, in fact, at Amazon 10, 15 years ago, you would see over time how their business models change. So in fact, forget about going indulging in the quantitative number, go back to the stand your filing, and the answer lies down there. A company tells you about their identity, tells you who they are. Walmart will tell you who they are, IBM tell you who they are, Walmart tell you. Now, of course, that's a good sign. We had thousands of and millions of newspapers, you know? So how are we going therefore to extract this information out of the thinking fine? So what we are talking about here, therefore, unstructured data, you know, in compared to structured data, which is quantitative. And now the question, the key one, how can we extract insight and information out of structured data? That is the advent of what I call, you know, topic modeling, statistical supervised learning, and machine learning. That's the power that we are witnessing today, which what you're seeing, the GPT and all that. It's all that contextual power. So, of course, from that, you can conclude something, yeah? You could say, well, you know, the MSCI and SMP and Morgan Stanley had missed a big chunk about this information from that they can find. Now, they didn't do it deliberately. I think they just, maybe they didn't have the capability, I would say 10 years ago, to do that. But now we do. So now we, we can't anymore. You would not be forgiven just say, to ignore the information from the taken filing. So you have got to go to the taken filing and try to learn what is the company's identity. And that was the biggest thing that we have spent actually years, three years to excite up information. Okay. So we come therefore to what we would call the topic specification. Okay, so this is what is alternative to the JIX. So the JIX is based on structure, quantitative number, the topics is based on unstructured data, and the objective is to use machine learning algorithms to try to extract that information out of it. And we call it topics, you know? And people who are familiar with probably LDAs, HDPs, and all the, I don't want to go details, they would kind of understand that this is now the modern day technology to kind of take the information out. Okay, so, what happens in this here, 
the new insight, the first new insight we found out is that, you know, a given company now, and that's exactly answers the crowd of world one and many asset managers, is no more sitting in one sector. You can say a company belongs only to one sector. In fact, a company can belong to multiple sectors because now we are looking, the topics modeling allows you to give probabilistic weighting, and now you know, to allocate a company in different sectors. Okay, so. Pardon? Exactly. Yeah. He, exactly. Yeah. Here it's different. Here we are not talking about it. Here we are talking about how a company describes itself. And the key here that a company keep changing year after year. So what Amazon was talking about itself in 2000 when they're selling books and records is different than Amazon that's talking in 2020 and 2023 when it actually has AWS. So you can see the evolution. Okay. So now if you talk about Amazon now, and I actually want to see what is its probabilistic weighting you'd find actually 15% in consumer discretionary, while 80% is in information technology, 4% in financial sectors, and, you know, because, and, and a little bit in consumer goods. On the other hand, if you compare it to Walmart, you'll find actually 43% in real estate. That was actually, I gave an interview at Harvard. For me, that was a shocking news. Because they own so much buildings and lands, that is actually a source of income and revenue for them. You and I wouldn't see that through their business revenue, but because actually they are a, you know, a real estate owners. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but, but, that, but that's their, in, but that's the way they describe themselves into their thing. So, so do they charge one subsidiary? Rent for the others that own the real estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think that's what it, that's the way that's the way they they describe themselves. And the majority of their revenue, you would think, is coming from the retail. It's no. It's coming also from real estate. And someone actually wrote an article when we published said, "Is Walmart a real estate company?" Yeah, and I have a reference for that. Just independent. It was actually mind blowing. Seriously, for us. So it's amazing. And you find in fact. You know, 28% consumer discretionary, 17% manufacturing essential costs. So you can see fundamentally now, Amazon and Walmart, from a risk profile point of view, completely different from different. They have different allocation, different probabilistic allocation. And so therefore, as an investment manager, as a hedge fund manager, as a big bank, you have to think completely different between these two. And that applies across the S&P 500. You'll be shocked to see how many stocks are actually generally different from each other. Okay. So what we found actually through, you know, the, the, I would say machine learning algorithms and skipping all, and this is all in the paper, which I'm happy to forward it to you. You can see all the details that there are actually 15 topics. You know, it's like 11 sectors, we have 15 topics. And, you know, and these topics, some of them have some sense of pre-familiarity with the JIC, some of them are different. So this is like, I would say the big major. So this is the topic one to 15. And here, what I would say, we label them. Yeah, we get the names so that actually people can relate to them. So you can see actually the topics does have utility. Yeah, and it intersects with the utility of the JICs with seven thousand seven ton stocks. But there could be actually other ones like energy here have twenty seven with energy, but it's still with industry. Let's take this one here, real estate. You know, you know th that topic here. It has some in financials. Some in industrials, some in real estate, and three in actually consumer discretion. So there's a hybrid, yeah, because now the mechanism of the allocation is much more distributed. It's not anymore belongs into a single category, yeah. So some of them they have one to one mapping, some of them they don't. Like here, for example, you have healthcare, you know, and um, uh, like here, sex, for example, manufacturing and consumer discretionary. There's no nothing anymore like consumer discretionary and manufacturing. There's a hybrid between them, and you can see that here, um, or six, you know, 24 industrial, 11 in consumer discussion, 11 stocks is this entry. So this is how we actually group them. So therefore, in the topics modeling, the grouping of stocks have completely now changed, fundamentally changed. Some of them they match with the jet, some of them 
they have nothing to do with the magic. Just... I have a question though. Let's take example of one, let's take example of one of the companies in the energy gig sector, right? Yeah. One of the 27, right? Yeah. So that company has got a bunch of weights in your tokens, right? Yes, so yes. How do, you, how do you do the first end is like for that company, let's, let's say that company, let's say, was 50% um, energy, oil, and gas and 50% real estate. How do I see that allocation? Yeah, here you don't see. Here is it. There's another matrix which we created. I hope I got it. Okay, let me. I'm going to come to your point. But now here, actually, visualization. You like visualization? How each topic looks like. You know, you look for example the financial. Yeah, topic 15. The majority of it is bank, so it's, it's a big word. There's a lot of actually long lines. Finance. So what the topic does. Topic modeling is actually it looks into each 10k filing and look what are the words that are common, you know, among all these different stocks in it. And it will group them together according to the actually the topic word, which is actually described into their business description. And then they group the stocks and map those stocks to those topics. Yeah. Now, coming to you, with, so this is like, for example, shows you, um, you know, uh, like this is energy, it talks about drilling. Pipeline, transport, you know, field exploration, food, you know, petroleum. You know that this is actually an energy side. That's how you would actually be able to label. It. So from the grouping of words, you'll be able to label it correctly. Okay. Now coming to your point, uh, this is what you're talking about. That's the other. Unfortunately, I don't have the uh, the link here, but there's a link which actually shows you each sock how it belongs. So let's say here. So uh, let's see if I can uh, here, for example. Amazon, I think Amazon. Where is it? Uh, Amazon. In the middle, a little bit lower. Here, yeah. yeah, fantastic. So you see, Amazon. So in the JIG sector, it's consumer discretionary. In the sub sector, it's called an internet and dark marketing retail. For us, no. Amazon now, let's look at it here, okay? Yeah, this is like the probability of, uh, this is the measure of the probability of the distribution of the words within each topic. Okay. Uh, but I think what I'd like you to focus on here now is this here, like the data from Amazon here. Look at here, for example, in this case, 80% of Amazon is in T4. This is information technology. 15% is in T9, T, uh, in, in T11, yeah? And this is, if you look at our labeling, T10 is actually what I would call consumer discussion. And so on. you look at Walmart here, yeah, you can see here 17% in uh, like 43% is in D9, or I think yeah, yeah, which is actually real estate, 20% in consumer discretionary, and 17% is in T1, which I think in manufacturing and products. And now the key thing that all these products equate the sum to one. Yeah, so it's great. So now you actually solve a very important problem that actually a stock a given stock, no more is allocated in one God-given sector. It's actually distributed. It's up to the risk manager and the trader and the quant trader to decide how he wants he or she to do the allocation and correctly and trade it out. So it has a very powerful implication in terms of the market. Of course, you'd say, wow, okay, this is all good, but how can you prove? <laughs> so now, now here's where work like Peter would jump on me. Okay, great market for you. But can you actually prove that your topics is much better than the JEX? Can you actually mathematically prove it? And we did. That's why I said this work took over three years because we really need to dig into what kind of mechanisms, what kind of factors we can prove one is superior to the other, okay? So the first thing we looked at, and this is a work done actually by a group of uh, you know, financial uh, you know, researchers, uh, I, you know, and I, the reference for the paper is they, they looked at something similar between the JICs and other indexes like the SIC and all that, you know, other terms. And they use what they are called the fundamental row factors. You know, these are, you know, numbers that represent stocks, profit per earning, dividends, leverage, and here are they, I guess, returns, book the price. So you, what you need to do is actually, you want to take these, and you want to look in each sector how much a stock is close to his, their group of friends, yeah, within each sector. That closeness, which you can actually use 
and you know a, a regression model, it will tell you what is the adjusted R square of a given stocks relative to a group, the average of a group of stocks. So that will tell me how much a close in a stock in, let's say, consumer discretionary compared to a stock to a group on my kind of definition of the problems. That's right. So the distance, the similarity. See, the JIX doesn't provide similarity. It does not tell you how close Amazon is to Walmart. It doesn't have that big as here you do. As we're able to measure. Cross section. Yeah, you take the cross sectional average of all the group of stocks close and try to actually rest against one of a given stock. Yeah, so one stock against the many. And you keep repeating that. And this. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. But because exactly, we look at the so for us, the firm is for a given year, yeah. so we measure year by year. Yeah, you know, but yeah, you, you, yeah, I mean. Here, of course, in terms of the time series, the information is year by year, but we are looking at over the course of the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. These are regressions about 10 or 15. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's how we can. Okay. I, I understand. So multiple words, that must be just the, the PQ ratio, I suppose. Yeah, that's like, yeah. What, what, is it, what is the financial fundamental? What does the NFRR? What that is? Ah, these are. The fundamental ratios. These are these guys here. Oh, any one of these. Any one of these. Any one of those. Yeah, exactly. I understand. Exactly. Okay. But here, this exercise was done before. Okay, by actually prior researchers. So we repeated the same mechanism to prove that at least up to what prior research proved, we proved it, that the topics is superior to the jets. I'm going to show you the number here. But that's why I call it plus twelve plus one because these are all static measurement. The plus one here is the risk adjusted return of portfolio construction, which is what we've done extra. So now what we're saying, okay, we can take all these 12 metrics, you know, for all the fundamental ratios, but we are going to add actually another very powerful thing, which is the risk adjusted return of a long short equity. If I construct a long short equity based on my topics, is it superior to that of the jigs? This is what the guys at Millennium. Well, yes, you want. You don't care about that, to be honest with you. you. say, okay, great. This is a nice theoretical word. For a professor at Harvard or here, probably uh, this is the, but for a guy in the industry, that's the one they want to know. Can I actually construct a much more profitable portfolio, better risk portfolio than? And so we answered them. So this is here, actually, the results. Our comparison to the JITS. And you can see really, in terms of overall average of R squared, we are far more superior in terms of the percentage and in terms of the relative performance. So it and, and actually you put them superior one by one. So there's no room for that. Nothing. One by one, all the sweat factors were superior. And now the ultimate test is of course the portfolio construction. So what we did, okay, so here we went back to our intuitive way of how we do trading. And usually you can do trading in two ways. So we proved it in two ways. One is discretionary. So, I discre so we took the case of you are a discretionary manager or a quant manager. You know, for a discretionary manager, what do you do? You devise a momentum trading strategy. You take the long, the most outperforming stocks, you go along with those, and the underperforming stocks you go short. Okay, just you know, hand rule. And if you are a, a quant um, strategist, you know, what do you do? You would use a quantitative strategy, you use machine learning, and you apply it. So we applied the same methodology on stock selection in the JIPS versus in the topics, hand by hand. Yeah, so we didn't change it. So the same mechanism we applied in each of our and this is the result. So what we showed, in fact, that the topics over all, like if you create, if you create a master portfolio of long short equity, whether you're a discretionary trader or you're a quant, so answer the two words, you would outperform the type of jigs in those cases by a significant amount of numbers, and you can see the number of And this is a new life. I mean, for a quant manager or a special manager, that's a lot. 4% annualized is a lot of money. In PNL, 
you know, if you're 100 million, then you know, really 40 million into your pocket, that's a great number. So that was also, I'd say, quite a lot of extensive work. We used a lot of, okay, now you might tell me, I mean, I'm critical, you know, look, you know, we heard about machine learning and all that. We try, of course, to, in our proof, to make sure that our answer does not rely on a specific model in the proof. So we use a lot of ensemble modeling, to make sure that it's actually independent from the model that we are using. So ultimately the result is modeling there, which is, makes it factual. Okay. Like in the case of the Longshore portfolio is data neutral and based on the data you calculate in the regression. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And the way are the longshore is the weight based on that data? Based on that data, yeah. The data you mean from the previous model? From the regression. No, 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 it's a different one. This is the, the, that data is for those 12 factors. Here, it's a completely different structure. Here, you actually now use quantitative methodologies to identify what are the laws in the shorts, you know, given your knowledge now where sectors set. So like now for me, when I do a sector neutral long short, in the checks I know, I take the sector and I take long and short. Here now I have a different sector definition. So my long and shorts are different. What's your barrier that expected returns coming from? Pardon? Barrier expected returns coming from long short. It's coming from actually taking a specific long position and a specific short position and the performance the return price action of the long solutions. You've got to have, when you say, a very long one stock, you really want to be long the higher returns of yeah. both the lower. Exactly, very, exactly. The forecast of returns. What is your forecast based on for future returns? Well, of course, I mean, I mean, in this case, you know, there is nothing here. What you are trying to do is essentially look at a performance of a given stock, you know, across time, yeah? And you're trying to make a prediction based on the latest performance, you know, from your model, because you're doing back testing. You're doing a financial time series back testing. You see what I'm saying? And of course, it's not a hand rule. You never, you know, back testing is different. But when you are doing a time series, year after year after year, that's how you actually pick up. So the prediction power is coming from the fact that you have learned the pattern of a given stock in the last month, two months, three months, and four months, and you are making a prediction for the next month. And then, so there's a rebalancing process. That in this case, you're right. There's a rebalancing assumption that I'm doing monthly rebalancing. So I learn about the previous month, and I say, okay, this stock actually is not performing, and I'm going to now go long on this stock, or I'm going to go short accordingly. So like what you told us, say you, you put stocks in a quantiles, you know, Q1 to Q5. Say, okay, my Q1 and are the longs, and Q5s are the shorts. Now, next month, this could change. Some stock go from Q1 to Q2, and so on. Yeah. But the selection process, the mechanism, is done now very much driven by you know, ensemble learning you know, across all these sectors. So the whole idea is stick to one particular objective, but uh, category, all, all about this. Pick, find the stocks that seem to outperform the other. Then, but you, you're always waiting one-to-one, one, dude, the beta is going to be different, right? Exactly, yes. It wouldn't all be one-to-one. One, exactly. Yes, don't Now, our, what's, good point, what's so key about this is that now you are grouping stocks in topics that they have similar risk profiles. Yeah, because of the way they describe their own business. And now you can see, in fact, the impact here in terms of when we compare to, you know. Um, so this is here the, uh, graphic represent this is the community. This is, of course, the annualized. This is the cumulative return of the topics model in green, the jigs model below, and the SP 500. You know, you can see, of course, it's shot along the way. So, this is actively like you're actually trading, it's a, it, it simulates a trading environment. You know, and now we did even more. <laughs> so, okay. We, we, we proved it across all the stocks. Let's now actually compare them sector by sector, where there's actually similarities in sectors. Let's see, in fact, if we take a sector portfolio in the topics that's similar, let's say utilities or energy, this is actually outperform that in the JIPs. So we are zooming in now. We're not satisfied by just like looking at the full master portfolio. Yeah? So because you can say, okay, let me take all the S&P 500 stocks and let me go long short. Now I say, no, 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 we want to do even better. Let's look at those sectors 
where there is actually similarity, energy sector and utility, healthcare, do we see them they actually outperform within the sector? And the answer is yes. That's actually, that was the finale you know, for us, that we could actually go to the energy sector and we can show the topics energy sector outperform that of the JICs, the same thing with utilities, the same thing with healthcare, and the same thing with technology, and the same thing with real estate. So that nailed it for us. We know now we are very confident that now not only you're looking at the sector level where there is actually comparison, that there's our performance also at the global master level. So this, I would say that was the plus one because this is a dynamic process, yeah? This is not like a static thing. This is actually a live, it's like you're actually simulating really a real trade in life in terms of how to show that this is actually working. And then here, of course, an example of a long short technology portfolio comparison between the JICs and the topics. Of course, here you can see a big drawdown in 2020. Look at this. I, I don't look, I, I don't like to look at this just only on the lines. I like to look at the drawdowns because this is very important. Here, why sometimes you get blow up? Because just some of them in the JICs happen not to be belong to the same sector in technology. Some stuff actually really they're not technology, but they've been done to technology. So the risk profile is blowing up. But here, they are generally grouped up together correctly. And that's the key. That's the key for our discovery is that the topics allows you from the take and filing to group stocks which have not only similar business description, but similar risk profile. That's the fundamental thing. That's how the big R big is. Here, of course, uh, you can see the virtue of being a long short compared to a long, like if you, you know, if you look at the S&P 500, for example, I mean, here, like this is 2015 between the long short, but here, look at that here, this is COVID. Yeah, this is the S&P 500. This is our long short here, because again, we manage this much better. And that's, I think, very important. Um, so, conclusion, we actually identified 15 new industry and sector classification using the 10K filing, highlighting the importance of unstructured data in extracting new type of knowledge and insight on firms based on their business description and product offering. The data science, that's a very fundamental. We live in the data science age and it's here to stay. You cannot anymore turn your back and say, this is fine. no, this is actual science. Backed up by statistical and machine learning topic model produce much more accurate industry and sector classification stuff, which call it topics. We actually prove using adjusted R square that our topics is far more superior than of the JICs. And then we, push the boundary by actually constructing a long short portfolio based on this topic classification. And we show among at least five sectors the superiority. And then of course, across all the 15 sectors combined. So that's pretty much of the three years work, but I just wanted to kind of summarize the concept and the implication that's going to happen in the market. So now, for example, people who hopefully, and we might actually end up coming to like a new definition of what we mean by market, because again, this and P500 is grouped incorrectly according to the JICs. For me, I think the JICs now have lived outdated this time and it needs now a refurbishment. I'm hoping that we have provided the answer. Thank you. Could it take one month? Could it take one topic? It would be on to three topic sector. Okay, so then you can start with a Ah, very good point. So now here there is excellent point. So at some point you need to compare apples with apples, okay? So what if we can say in our case, we want to choose actually you know, a little bit of refinement in our topics. So we're going to choose a threshold and we actually prove that threshold. Let's say if a stock is above 75% in a given topic, I'm going to allocate that stock fully to that topic. Okay, so we created, I would say, a portfolio of 300 stocks. I would call them they are in a pure state. Pure state means that their weighting is above, like Amazon, yeah, it's 85%. I would say Amazon is a technology sector, even though there's 15%, you know? But Walmart doesn't meet that pressure. It's for, so it is in a mixed state. And therefore, Walmart cannot fall into a sector neutral strategy. Because we're just keeping it out. Yeah, completely. 
because now we treat the mixed state completely different from the pure state. So out of the 500 stocks of SP, only 300 have got the title of being in the pure state because the majority of them are actually about 75%. So we, call, we create what we call tier groups. Tier one, where the weight of a given stock is above 75% belongs to the sector. So this we call the pure state. So they are like the JIPs. So our 300 delimits the 500 of the SP. But then we have tier two and tier three. In tier two, the sum of the weights is about 75%. So that's a bit narrow. And tier three, the sum of the three weights is 75. And those are a new world altogether. We haven't even started to actually investigate tier two and tier three. We focus on tier one to see, in fact, how do we compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. Yeah. So the SP had 500 stocks, we have 300. They are genuinely had that, what I was called, the pure state characteristics. Now you say, how did you pick up 75? That's the mathematics and the, the detail that we have actually. Uh, the, the old bar, um, I think US Yeah, no, of course. Uh, yeah. They could see it. You see, they could. I'm not saying they could come that other there. They could use the revenue, but it's not going to be complete. The revenues is not sufficient. It doesn't tell you, in fact, from a risk point of view, where the allocation is correct. It's only when actually you read the way they describe themselves, because they do talk about the risk factors. They do talk about what businesses flow. They actually project how they are going to grow. I mean, the take on filing is really mind blowing. And, and what's so nice, I might say, wow, how could you extract that information? Luckily, because the thinking filing are actually a regulatory filing, the way Amazon file thinking filing is the same with Microsoft right there. You know, they all have business description, risk profile, business description as well. So machine learning goes hungry for those and just suck the information out. It was very powerful. It was extremely powerful. And now you can tell you at Harvard, we have like, I would say. 20 professors that are just focusing on taking filing. Some of them are using it now for climate change. Some of them are using it actually for AI harm. I mean, it's really because it is like a like a Bible to take a file because a company cannot lie about its identity. They can be sued. So they have to tell you the truth. The revenue doesn't always tell you the truth. You never know. It's numbers. But they cannot lie to take a file. So you are going to get the three essence of a company's business description and its risk profile. That's, that's, I think. Why did two companies that had similar ratings across two sectors, right? Yeah. Let's say, would I expect to see a high correlation in the returns, daily returns? In what? If uh, I had to say, like, okay, Amazon is 75% IT, 20% retailers, 4% yeah. everything else, right? But there was another company that your model allocated waste. Exactly the same. Yeah. Would I expect to see a very high correlation of their returns? Exactly. The but yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's that, that's that's the, that's the test of all those fundamental raw ratio correlation analysis. Actually, that that's analysis is a correlation analysis. You had like the, you had like a generic element. Yeah. The, right? Yeah, yeah. This is correlation. This is adjusted R square. It is actually correlation. The other funky name for adjusted R square is correlation. So you're spot on there. Absolutely. The other, the other, all the fundamental ratios. Exactly. You're right. So we are going here. Yeah. Number one. Number one. Yeah. Well, but then we, we, we regress on PB and book to value, leverage, growth, all those very important, I would say, fundamental raw ratio risk factors. Yeah. So, but it's a kind of a correlation analysis because you have to ask them within. Within a grouping, yeah. How close this stock, how soon the stock is to its group, to its members? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's the key. Is it a kind of factor analysis, sort of? Like, um, separate funds that are not related to each other. So you have the stock some sort of metric that you apply to 
you can think of it as this graph as uh, the unbreakable graph, and each edge is labeled with some measure of uh, similarity uh, between the two things. Oh, so, so, I'm so the, the vertices are the companies, and the vertices yeah. are, the are the companies. I yeah, see. but that said, you know, in this case, it seems to me that the the what the labels in the edges can be derived from the form of the description. Exactly. Exactly. Correct. And then what you hopefully add is if you derive it, if you weight the, the edges, label the edges in this way, and find sort of some sort of minimal set of some property composition, you'll find a bunch of it. Think of it as uh, a covariance matrix, but you got these diagonal blocks, okay. and they're hard, you know, highly correlated to each other. The off diagonal block that is the link. So here, the clusters, the sort of correlation, you have the similarities uh, based on the identity description, and the off that uh, and the off diagonal blocks have weaker similarities, but within the block, oh, that's higher. Yeah, there's a bunch of things that are not just the descriptions that are higher, but the uh, valuations that are higher, yeah. the financial ratios that are uh, not higher, that are more similar. They're hmm. more similar. Correct. Yeah. They, they, but, they, uh, some of them, though, I, I, I'm not sure that they will be similar. Prices will go to very variable across uh, these tech companies. Yeah. Price and then net operating assets, right? Le maybe leverage also. I don't know. Leverage, yeah, but leverage is here. I know, yeah. It's yes. here too. Yeah. But it's interesting to see that actually across the board, there's that outperformance. Like we didn't see any inconsistency in one of them to kind of yeah. make us pause. So like, for instance, then, if you're looking at the banking sector, right? Um, they might be looking, they're, 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 they're lumped in the same GIC, right? Yes. But if the two banks have very different leverage, you would they would be separated out, so to speak, in your mind. Yes, they would, right? yeah, they're, they're, very different. they're a different thing. Yeah. They would have the two may, not be, may not be, it depends on how they to describe themselves. Uh, um, they, they, they can be a plan. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It depends how they describe themselves. I think about it. Usually, what does if there are grouping of words, so stock A and stock B could have similar words that they actually could bundle under that thing yeah, that, under that topic. So you're and, 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 uh, and UBS might describe them very great, yeah, correct, yeah, correct. So some things would be the other things that funding folks etc. would be like this. Correct. Maybe you wouldn't see it the description. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt, uh, just a simple question. About the 10K, uh, you're, you're extracting information from the 10K, you're saying it's unstructured. So how did you kind of make that a structured piece of data and use like uh, JSON files or something to make API calls? How did you like train an algorithm on the data from the 10K? Yeah, because essentially you, you would extract out of the 10K file what what's called uh, the words, right, yeah? Right. So then we do a word embedding. That's the technical jargon. Word embedding, and that word embedding would give us a grouping. Where, where among the 10K file, there are groups of words that really close to each other, like, you know, as we see. And, and then, like in this uh, beautiful visual here, here, for example, yeah? So this is what it is. That's the whole premise of topic model, is that it actually look at concepts and which out of those concepts are very close to each other. So here you look, funds, you know, credit, you know, credit cards, Loans, bank, payment, they have similar concepts. So it's groups, you know, and there's weight associated with that, you know? And so that's how, that's how it's because, and then of course, while you're grouping together, there's a map coming from the stock world to this. So then we would know which stocks belong here, and which one belongs here, which one belongs here. And that's how we'd identify their allocation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can download the files. Bunch of different formats, PDF if you want, yeah. but you can also do that in XDRL uh, or Excel. It's a monitor form of markup. 
and they're available actually. You have to take your file on public public data. Right, right. So you, you can actually access them and then you know, and then you need to create the corpus, you know, of words and, and you know go through the usual word embedding and you'll be able to start discovering those. So when was the one that I met at RPI at a workshop a couple years ago, Peter Newers actually spoke here in our seminar, but I missed it because I was teaching a part of Gupta, and she was on leave at the SEC to work on language recognition, whatever the right yeah. word is, yeah. or uh, not just the pancake, but other releases public yeah. companies put out. Mm -hmm. I think their argument was, um, I think you're trying to better, get a better understanding of relative risks, risks of companies, whatever. Yeah. But specifically it was doing, what's the right, um, language recognition, whatever the word is. I don't know, language processing? No, whatever. NLP, not, yeah. natural yeah. language processing, yeah. NLP. Yeah. Exactly. So now here we've gone beyond NLP. We are using what's called large language models, which is you'll see it's blowing up like crazy now. It's like the Gucci, the new world. But while it has the dark side, there's the positive side. Of it. There is actually science behind it. There's a very powerful, as long as you have the technology and you the right data, to actually really get some quantitative information out of it. And you can measure the accuracy. Here, while we present, there's a lot of metrics of how can we be sure that our result is correct. So there's a lot of accuracy measures. That we have adopted to kind of give us confidence that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you do. You could use LDA as a topic model, you could SGP, you could use BERT, you could use Timbuktu, and you are going to come to the same conclusion. It is unavoidable. And I think this is where the weakness of the JICS and the SMP. And um, so hopefully, when this paper is going to be circulated now, you know, hopefully we can start kind of figuring out. And I'm, and I'm happy to discuss it with you and any thoughts you guys have because I think it will be very, very good. To kind of push that. But I know at least from the world I came from, which is the investment world and the and the trading strategy, they'll be very delighted to hear that because they are crying out loud, Jix is not right. What's the right answer? I believe now we kind of touched this of what potentially could be the right answer. I'm not saying this is it, but at least this is something very much on the right path in the sense you cannot anymore ignore unstructured data, you can't ignore text, you can't ignore information hidden in the and, and that will give you new type of insights like those we have. And we can see already that there is you know, improvement when you do portfolio construction and uh, you do correlation analysis about the stocks. So we are very happy about that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank any you, guys. Case, yeah, you want to ask, uh, are there any questions online? Yes, absolutely, yes. Oh, there's, there's some, there's, there's one chat, yeah. Hey, let's see on the chat here, absolutely. Um, from eBay. No, uh, we didn't try the RBC. We did, uh, you know, we used BERT models, for example. We used uh, word embedding um, uh, classification techniques, LDA. So we used like about four or five different models. I think the more than enough. But I'm happy if anybody can try another form of classification and, and, and see, you know. But I think, I, I don't know, says so. I don't know if, you can, uh, if, the, uh, if the person can actually tell us what's that. You, could you tell us what TRBC is? Yeah, actually, let me let me talk to him. Oh, Thompson Road. Oh, I see. Thompson Road. Okay. Ah, Thompson Road. No, maybe. I know. I know Thompson Road is. They have a lot of uh, tools, but uh, no. I think here what we use our own proprietary models. That's the case. That's yeah. The case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. What we use essentially large language models, LDAs. HDPs and BERTs to kind of really make sure that our classification can convert to the same kind of conclusion. I wonder, let's take, let's take the uh, information technology big sector, right? Yeah. If it's got like 50, 40, 50 companies in it? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you took the average pairwise correlation of returns of those stocks? Do you think because of the rapidly changing technology, that average pairwise is? is Changed a lot in the last five, 10 years. Exactly. Yeah. So you see, the point is that JIX does not update. It's not like the take your finding where every year a company could change. And that's why we're using the take your finding for actually climate change, because you can see a company is actually becoming from non client compliant to client compliant. So that finally actually have information to that. While the JIX is pretty much static, unless there's a merger and acquisition, they will go and change the company. But it's very static. That's the problem. 
and it lacks a very powerful lack of information. And that's why I think this is a, there's a theme in this thing now that any you move on in any kind of quantitative research finding function, you see, you just cannot ignore any more, you know, unstructured data. You've got to include it because it, it could have the information inherited it could be even far more important and powerful than actually quantitative data itself. Uh, I can okay, hear me, uh, Dr. Mark. Yes, hello, I can hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is you by uh, and uh, uh, the reason I, I ask why you uh, have do you ever use the PRPC is that I'm actually working in Refinitive, so it's uh, previously the Thompson routers. So uh, I'm just asking that uh, uh, since we have this business classification, just like gigs, so have you ever tried to use the topics versus uh, TRBC before? Uh, or you no. only tried? Yeah, good question. No, we have not compared uh, to against the RBC. No, we have not. We we, okay. we try to kind of really compare what is the market standard at the moment. And so I've seen like, can we outperform the market standard, which is the gist. Okay. Yeah. But but thank you very much for highlighting that. That would be uh, kind of an important exercise. Why not? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the inspiring uh, speech. Yeah. Never ever have to do it to try and the last for our quarter finals. <laughs> no, that would be good. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 we have, we, have, we have one. So at the moment, we just focus on equities, you know, because equities is like a big problem. Because actually, asset managers are losing a lot of money because they are grouping stocks incorrectly. And, and, and COVID 2020 was a disaster. I mean, some of the people lost a lot of money because an alpha. Because some stocks have completely different profile. They are part of the same sector, but they've gone. And people, what is going on here? You know, and I think this is what's going on. There are actually some of them, they just genuinely don't belong to the same sector. So therefore, your risk hedge could be completely different. The way I would hedge Amazon is very different now the way I would hedge against one money. That's very important. Any other questions, we audience? Welcome, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right.